Small spaces. Twenty. Ollie hurried to the window, heart thudding. The house was surrounded. The scarecrow's blind eyes stared up. Ollie ran for the door, burst past the ghost, and then she was racing down the stairs. Brian! Coco! Behind her, the ghost screamed out a long wail of despair. The kitchen smelled of burning. Ollie ran in, found herself coughing. The oven was billowing smoke, and Brian and Coco sat at the table dazed. Ollie ran forward furiously to shake them by the shoulders. Brian stared up at her, red-eyed. This is why you don't make fires in strange stoves, Ollie growled. They smoke and you die. Brian was getting clumsily to his feet, shaking his head, coughing. Coco, much smaller, was mostly unconscious. Help me, Ollie cried. She grabbed Coco's shoes and socks, still drying on the stove, and heaved them and her lunchbox back into her backpack. Brian, stumbling, propped Coco under his shoulder. They all staggered out of the kitchen. It's almost dark, said Ollie as they went. The scarecrows are outside. We'll have to hide in here then, said Brian. No locks on the doors, said Ollie. If there's a cellar, I didn't see it. She had an image of them cowering in a closet that didn't lock, while those slow, shuffling scarecrows beat the door down. Coco whimpered, but didn't wake. The barn, Ollie cried. It probably has a hayloft. We could pull up the ladder. Are you sure? Brian asked. No, said Ollie, but I think it's better than here. Our best chance. She looked at her watch. Three minutes. Brian unexpectedly slung a cocoa over his shoulder in what Ollie vaguely recalled was a fireman's carry. The Boy Scouts are no joke, are they? she asked. Brian grinned crookedly, and then they ran for the front door. Outside, it was the very edge of night, blue-black sky, clouds, no stars. The scarecrows clustered thick around the house, waiting. The light was almost gone. Ollie looked down at her watch, 45 seconds. We can't go out there, Brian whispered, recoiling. It's too late. They'll make us scarecrows too. They won't, Ollie whispered back. It's not night yet. Come on. She slipped out of the house and started across the yard. Brian followed more slowly, carrying Coco. The scarecrows stood perfectly still, snarling or smiling, their faces paper bag white in the last of the daylight. Ollie and Brian dodged around them and then broke into a stumbling run, heading for the barn. Just as they passed the last of the scarecrows, Ollie's watch beeped and they were out of time. Footsteps behind them, Ollie darted into the barn, praying. Brian was only a step behind her. Coco, waking up, saw what was behind them and shrieked. Ollie spun to look. The scarecrows were shuffling toward the barn. Brian shot into the barn on Ollie's heels and dropped Coco, none too gently, to the dusty wooden floor. He and Ollie heaved the barn door shut, looked at each other, and each took a grip on a handle. There was no lock. They were left in pitch darkness. Coco, with trembling hands, got her phone out and shone her light around. The hayloft was there, no ladder. Ollie felt the first creeping of despair. This wasn't a small space, not small enough. The scarecrows could get in. She could hear their shuffling steps just outside. She was holding on to the door handle for all she was worth. The ladder's in the hayloft, said Coco, coughing. She craned on her tiptoes. I can't see it. A lot of good it will do us there, said Brian, between gritted teeth. A steady pressure grew on the other side of the door, as if many hands had seized hold of the outside handles and were beginning to push. Wait, cried Coco. Wait, wait. Yeah, grunted Brian. Tell the scarecrows to wait, because that always works. Coco ignored him. Shut up and hang on, said Ollie grimly to Brian. She had seen what Coco was doing, and her heart beat fast with desperate hope. Coco ran barefoot for the barn walls, tripping on loose floorboards. 
The barn had a post and beam construction so that the posts that supported the barn structure stuck out a bit from the wall itself. Coco threw off her backpack and wiped her sweaty hands on her jeans. Coco, any time now, screamed Ollie. From the other side of the door came scrapes and thuds. The veins were standing out in Brian's hands. He and Ollie had all their weight against the door, but they were both in danger of being yanked off their feet. The door shook. Brian yelled, I can't hold it. We have to, said Ollie. Coco let out a deep breath, grabbed the post, and began climbing. Ollie kept half an eye on her progress, even as she felt splinters from the door handle work their way into her hands. Once Coco slipped and nearly fell, and Ollie seemed to feel the jolt in her own body. Come on, Coco, she shouted. Now Coco was at the height of the hayloft, high enough above the barn floor to break a leg if she fell. Now was the trickiest part where she would have to let go of the post she'd climbed, reach out, and grab the lip of the hayloft. Coco hesitated. The door shook. Coco! Brian yelled. Coco let go of the post, caught the edge of the hayloft, and swung a moment in space, one-handed. Ollie saw the hand slipping. Her heart seemed to leap into her mouth. But then Coco's other hand shot out and she pulled herself up. From as far as the barn door, Ollie could hear the whine of her breathing, almost a sob. But then Coco heaved herself to her feet, and the next moment the heavy hayloft ladder slid down and landed thump on the floor. Come on, guys, Coco yelled from above. If we can brace the door with something, panted Ollie, it might give us time to get up to the hayloft. Pull the ladder up after us. What if they can climb, said Coco from above, or jump? She was still breathing hard. They can't, said Ollie, hoping that she was right. They have garden tools for hands. There, cried Coco. She was shining her phone light around the barn floor. It lit up a pile of rusty shovels. Brian and Ollie looked at each other. Can you hold the doors? Ollie asked him. For about five seconds, Brian grunted. He took a new grip on the door and gritted his teeth. Now, cried Ollie. She let go of the handle, ran to the pile of tools, and grabbed a shovel. Brian's arms were trembling. The door had already begun to give. Ollie, he cried, just as she sprinted back and jammed the old wooden shovel handle sideways between the door handles. Brian let go. It shook, but held. Will it last? asked Brian, panting. Probably not, said Ollie grimly, but it might last long enough. It was witch soul dark in the barn, except for the stabbing beam of Coco's phone light. Come on, Coco cried. She pointed her phone at the ladder. The shovel handle was already splintering. Go on, Ollie, said Brian, shoving her toward the ladder. When she hung back, she, he said, go on, the ghost of a smile, chivalry, remember? Ollie met his eyes and without a word began climbing the hayloft ladder. No time to think of the height, not even time to be scared. Coco's light jerked up from the ladder to the door. Ollie risked a glance back. She was more than halfway to the loft. The old shovel handle was bending. With a crack, it gave. Now the door was sliding open. A soft, painted-on face thrust itself into the gap. Ollie made it into the hayloft just as the first scarecrows shuffled into the barn. Brian, right behind her, was still on the ladder. Hurry, Brian! Coco cried. Hurry! I hope they can't jump, Ollie thought. I hope they can't jump. The scarecrows had surrounded the ladder, shaking it from side to side. Brian made a desperate grab from the lip of the hayloft just as the old ladder went tumbling sideways and crashed down onto the barn floor. Brian! Ollie yelled. She and Coco hurled themselves forward at the same time and grabbed his hands. The ladder lay on the barn floor and Brian was dangling feet over the splintered wood above the grinning scarecrows. They made a whispering sound 
like straw rustling as they reached up their garden rake hands. Brian was heavy. His feet swung and kicked in midair. Ollie and Coco pulled together, pulled as hard as they could. Their sweaty hands slipped and slid. For a terrible moment, Ollie thought Brian's hands would slip right out of hers, that he would fall to the barn door, just like the ladder, and be snatched by scarecrows. But Brian, gasping, got a foot up, then another. A last panicked tug, and they were all in a trembling heap in the hayloft, safe for the moment, but with no way to get down. Could the scarecrows get up? That was the question. The scarecrows glared at them, but Ollie had been right. They couldn't climb with their garden tool hands. One of them tried to pick up the ladder, but Brian and Ollie and Coco kicked it off when they tried to lean the ladder against the hayloft. This time, when the ladder fell to the floor, it broke into two pieces and was unusable. We're safe, whispered Coco, we're safe. Her phone light flickered over the scarecrow faces. Maybe safe, whispered Ollie, for more and more scarecrows were pouring into the barn. Among them were several they recognized. There was Denise Carter, and then Elodie Finnegan, Jim Johnson. Their hands were garden tools, all of them button-eyed, with lips of string. Ollie swallowed. Let's see if they can talk she said. Maybe they can tell us something useful. How can they talk? Coco asked. Dunno. How can they walk? Hey, Ollie shouted before she could lose her nerve. Hey, can you talk? A sound from the scarecrows like the rattling of straw. Then Phil's face looked up at them. Brian let out a pained breath. A hole in Phil's straw mouth opened. A voice spoke like the wind in the wheat in summer. Come down, breathed Phil. Come down and join us. It's nice. You'll like it. You live forever and you'll never be sad again. Phil the idiot, Ollie had always thought. The guy who stuck girls' hair on the back of their seats with gum. But Brian was staring at his friend, his face blank with horror. She reached out to take Brian's hand. On the other side, she saw Coco doing the same thing. Ask him, whispered Ollie. Ask him if he remembers anything. Brian licked his lips. Hey, Phil! Gone was the hockey swagger. His voice a cracked whisper. Not much better than the sound of a scarecrow. What happened, man? Come down, returned the scarecrow. No! said Brian violently. Don't you remember? I'm Brian. Brian. We caught tadpoles in the creek when we were little. Your mom makes the best blueberry pie in the world. You were mad when I made the hockey team and you didn't, but you never said one word to me except, way to go. Suddenly, Phil's face moved more like a real face, just visible in the light of Coco's phone. Brian, whispered the scarecrow, in a different voice, Brian, where are we? Brian's hand was trembling in Ollie's, but his voice was steady when he said, I have no idea. How'd you get this way, huh? Can you tell me that? He smiled at us, breathed the scarecrow. I only remember the smile. Then the scarecrow's limbs jerked in a way that wasn't at all human. Maze, he whispered, in the maze. The brief humanity was gone from his face, fast as it had come. He was only a scarecrow, standing stiff in the straw. They stood in massed ranks, not looking up now, just standing, empty as dolls, waiting. Brian bowed his head. He was still shaking. Coco's phone reflected a little light into their faces, making them look like specters in the darkness of the haunted world. They were all still holding hands. At least Phil is still in there somewhere, said Coco. He's not gone. He remembered you. I'm sure he did. Brian didn't answer. They didn't say anything for a while. We ought to keep watch, said Ollie, rousing herself. If they could climb, they would be doing it already, said Coco. 
Still, said Ollie. After another pause, she said, I met Beth Webster's ghost in the front bedroom. Brian and Coco both swung around to look at her. She said that the smiling man was in the center of the maze, continued Ollie, that the maze is his doorway between worlds, and that the scarecrows hold it open somehow. After what Phil said, I think that's where we have to go, into the maze. It could be a trap, Coco pointed out. She had begun to shiver as hard as Brian as the shock from terror and climbing were off. Ollie saw that her hands were full of splinters and bloodied. She realized that neither Brian nor Coco could take any more thinking or speculation that night. We should get some sleep, Ollie said firmly, and decided in the morning. Brian, where's the first aid kit? Coco's hurt herself, and I definitely have splinters, and you probably do too. It doesn't matter, Brian said. It doesn't matter if your hands have splinters when they have trowels for hands, he giggled hysterically. Ollie whacked him in the arm. Stop that right now, she said. That's not helping. First aid kit. Then Coco's going to share some trail mix. No, wait, your backpack's still down there, isn't it, Coco? Well, I'll share some granola then, and we're all going to drink some water and take turns getting some sleep, okay? Okay, Ollie, Brian said, his voice thin and tired now. He and Ollie took turns picking the big, ugly splinters out of Coco's hands. Coco didn't make a sound. After a liberal application of alcohol and Snoopy band-aids, Coco said, Thanks, guys. Hey, said Ollie, you kind of saved our lives back there. Coco looked pleased. I did, didn't I, she said. They desplintered Brian, then Ollie. They shared the granola, and Ollie again blessed her dad's overpacking. Peanut butter and jelly for skiing, he used to say, ham and cheese for hiking. Ollie tried to let that memory warm her as the three took off their shoes and piled up their coats and backpacks to make something to sleep on. I'll keep watch for a bit. I want to do some thinking anyway, said Ollie. Get some sleep, guys. Brian and Coco settled themselves among the coats. Ollie wished she had grabbed the dusty blanket from the bedroom upstairs. Eventually, the others fell asleep, but Ollie did not. She sat peering over the edge of the loft for a long time. She thought about ghosts and scarecrows of the world hidden under the real one, of a person called the Smiling Man, of bargains. Until at last, Ollie, unable to keep her eyes open, woke Brian and tried to get some sleep herself. <laughs>